Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody this afternoon to our presentation. I'm going to be talking about uh, diabetes technology and tools today. Uh, this is not a comprehensive review of uh, insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors. I really wanted to do a broad overview of all different types of diabetes technology. I think sometime if we want to spend more time with uh, pumps and continuous glucose monitors, that would be better served in maybe a two hour workshop format. So we'll think about doing that uh, sometime in the future. I will have some case studies, however, uh, around some of these particular technologies. And I hope you'll come away today um, feeling more confident or maybe learn something about a technology that you weren't really aware of before. These are my disclosures. Our objectives are to learn benefits and limitations of different diabetes technologies, to apply the knowledge gained to clinical settings in diabetes practice, and to understand some basic continuous glucose monitor data. There are many different technologies out there on the market right now. Diabetes Forecast is one of American Diabetes Association's journals, and they do a comprehensive listing of all devices and technologies available every year. So I would encourage you to uh, seek that out. It's not hard to find. But today we'll be talking some about all of these technologies, pumps, continuous glucose monitors, smart pens, smart meters, different apps. We'll talk a little bit about personal devices. And I will talk a little bit about off-label, open source, closed loop diabetes, uh, pump, and uh, CGM technologies. So uh, let's start out by talking about smart meters, apps, and fitness trackers. Most every meter on the market right now, with few exceptions, is actually a smart meter. I am not specifically promoting any meter or meters. I'm just showing some that are more common in our area, mostly due to insurance coverage. But uh, a lot of these uh, are downloadable. Uh, they have memory. Uh, some of them allow you to enter things like sick days, exercise, or food and it will uh, keep track of different patterns for you. And uh, I think all of the ones I'm showing here have at least some of those features. Uh, some of them have phone apps as well. And uh, the Dario, which is uh, very interesting, actually uh, plugs right into the smartphone. Uh, this doesn't work with an iPhone 11, I don't think, because of the different plug-in system, but it does with a, a variety of other devices. The trick is to get patients to actually enter all different kinds of data into these. But if they do, when you get a download, you can get a very easy to read comprehensive overview of what's been happening with your patient and give the patient a lot of insight as well. I'm sure some of you have seen what some of these download logbooks look like, and they're sure a lot better than uh, people who uh, uh, need to write down every blood sugar in a traditional uh, logbook. About six years ago, the FDA came out with some guidance to improve the accuracy of meters. And at that time, the guidance issued was that home use meters, 95% of all measured blood sugar uh, values must be within 15% of the reference. And 99% of all meter values must be within 20% of the reference. There's also some interactive smart meters out there. Again, I'm not promoting a specific meter. Uh, this is one called Livongo, and uh, there is a company in our region uh, here in Northeast North Dakota, Northwest Minnesota, that issues this meter to all of their employees who have diabetes. And uh, this has uh, personalized insights. It generates uh, some insights about patterns maybe that you're having. Uh, it can also maybe talk about different trends that you might be having. It also has some on-call, on-the-go coaching, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 
uh, you can uh, interact with a certified diabetes educator. We don't feel that this supplants uh, visits with our certified diabetes educators. We really feel like this is an addition to what they would normally get from us. There's also a community that the users can join if they wish. And uh, with a subscription to this meter, they get uh, unlimited strips. Uh, the patients who I know uh, for this company who use this device really like it. And uh, they really like being able to have a lot of useful data, uh, not just a lot of data. This is a typical smart meter download logbook. You can see here that the green are values in range, which is defined by an American Diabetes Association value of 70 to 180. The yellow are hypoglycemia, which is defined as less than 70. And uh, some of the, uh, and the purple are uh, blood sugars that are elevated, which would be defined as over 1. We can see here that this patient is checking anywhere from four to six times a day, generally. Uh, I would not really identify any specific pattern here, except uh, perhaps uh, post-breakfast uh, hyperglycemia and occasionally some post-supper hyperglycemia. Uh, so of course we could take that data and we could make some adjustments or work with the patient on maybe some lifestyle factors here. There are also uh, several different apps out there that are a fairly good quality. There are a lot of apps, not all of them are good, uh, but these are some that I am more familiar with. And uh, these generally can keep track of blood sugar, some of them, most of them keep track of food and most keep track of activity. Um, the MyFitnessPal is more of a calorie counter and diet tracker, but also uh, uh, your activity. Uh, Glucose Buddy, of course, just by virtue of the name, you would guess that blood sugars can be entered. And some of these others are uh, really helpful databases for patients when they're trying to look up nutritional value of food. I have gotten to the point where I no longer guess at carb counting for my own insulin dosing. Um, I actually Google. Uh, or use, uh, I have often used Go Meals in the past as well. So there are plenty of online databases out there that if the patient takes an extra minute, they can at least get a carb count. But if they want a deeper dive into nutritional value of different foods, they can get that on a lot of these apps. There are some app meter subscription services. Uh, this one is the OneDrop. Again, I'm not promoting a specific device. Uh, they were giving these out as a promotion at American Diabetes Association last summer. And uh, this one, of course, has a phone app. And it's uh, fairly sophisticated with a paid subscription service uh, for data management. And that includes things like sick days, food, blood sugar trends, etc. It's uh, almost like a CGM without the CGM. And the more the uh, patient interacts with it, the better the data is. Uh, so this is a, uh, not a unique system, but a fairly advanced system. And it does cost a little bit more, uh, but with the subscription service, of course, that includes strips. An app that is supposed to be the most popular app in the world is one called MySugar. Uh, it's the most used diabetes app in the world, and their advertising tagline is helping diabetes not suck. As you might guess by that tagline, it was built and developed by persons with diabetes. And again, this is a bundled package uh, with, uh, that, of course, works with a smartphone. Uh, you can pay for more advanced services, such as trend analysis, etc. cetera. Um, it can uh, sync blood sugars from meters, some meters. It gives you an estimated A1C. Um, you can actually uh, have this interact with uh, some CGMs. Uh, it uh, also will allow you to do insulin calculations, it's kind of a bolus wizard type feature. And it also generates some personal uh, diabetes coaching uh, for the more advanced version that does have a monthly cost. Fitness trackers are ubiquitous. I don't think patients use these maybe to the full effect. Many of us are familiar with fitness trackers like Fitbit or Jawbone, and there are a number of different types within those brands. There are many devices, there are many applications, 
Some do have some data sharing and some of them uh, do have a phone app. The challenge with these, of course, is really uh, having the data meaningful, meaningfully integrate with an electronic health record. With a downloadable uh, logbook, that's not so difficult because that can be scanned into the chart. But these generally don't generate uh, those type of reports, although they, they, some of them do with the more advanced phone apps. Um, at minimum, uh, patients are going to get a step count with these, uh, but they can enter food, keep track of all of their food. Uh, some of them allow for things like sick days or change in pattern. And uh, data can be uh, very helpful with this. It can give them uh, weekly or monthly data, for example. And a lot of people tend to increase their step counts uh, after they start using these. So with regard to smart meters, apps, and fitness trackers, they are generally only worthwhile if the patient is willing to enter data, if they're willing to share that data with us, and if they follow the recommendations generated for some of the more advanced subscription service type uh, pieces. Patients who want to share this data with me, basically, they're usually showing me their step count and their food intake, which only takes a couple of minutes and is actually, actually can be very useful. I think insulin smart pens are a technology that is oft overlooked. Um, this is somewhere between kind of a regular pen and maybe an insulin pump. Uh, we still have some patients who are on insulin pens who use CGM, and they really don't want to pump, but maybe some of them would be good smart pen candidates. We don't have a lot of those in our practice, uh, but they do have things like memory. Some of them have a bolus wizard type calculator uh, function where you would put in the grams of carb and it would calculate a dose. Uh, the companion medical in pen, which I'm not specifically promoting, uh, also keeps track of insulin on board, which is a common insulin pump feature. That calculates how much insulin is, quote, still in the bloodstream, unquote, after a certain period of time after a bolus. So like with a pump, let's say you took five units of rapid acting insulin with a meal of a certain carb amount three hours ago. Uh, it can show you what the estimated amount of insulin there is still left, so maybe one unit in this case, and then it would uh, build that into a calculation for a correction dose or additional food bolus. So it does have some kind of pump-like features without really being a pump. Um, the uh, Novo and some of these others either have a phone app or can be used with uh, platforms like Gluco. And uh, platforms like Tidepool are, of course, adding devices all of the time uh, for data printout and data analysis. So uh, keep an eye on that. I think this uh, smart pen market is uh, kind of on the move a little bit. Um, they do give you that extra boost with some additional technology and features that uh, typical pens do not have. There's also some insulin dosing apps out there that can be used with pens. There's one called Clipsulin. Uh, of course, it has a phone app. Um, it calculates dose for a particular meal and it tracks the doses that you've taken. And things like daily totals, which the, which the smart pens do as well. And then uh, Lily actually uh, has an insulin pen dosing calculator now as well uh, that has a phone app. Uh, so for patients who maybe are looking for a little bit more uh, than a pen, uh, but maybe really don't want a pump, uh, some of these apps can be very useful. Again, we don't use a lot of these, but uh, they can be very helpful. So let's move on now to insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors, sometimes referred to as sensors. This is a pictorial history of insulin pumps. And uh, you can see like all electronics, these have really evolved over the years. On the far left, that is actually a picture of the first insulin pump. And the caption, I don't know if you can read it, is had an insulin pump before an insulin pump was cool. Uh, this was an interesting device in that it actually had glucagon too. And now we're kind of looping back around to that with some of these closed loop technologies in development where they might be bi-hormonal 
uh, systems. I'll talk a little bit about that before we close. But like all electronics, they have gotten um, uh, more compact as time has gone on. You can see through the late 70s and the 80s, these devices progressively got smaller and better. So that by the time we got to the early 90s, we were starting to see pumps like we might think of them today. And uh, by the late 90s and early 2000s, we were seeing some really nice devices. Um, in 2003, the first pump came out that had an interactive meter. And of course, that was very popular right away. That was a Medtronic. And again, I'm not promoting them specifically. That just happened to be the first one. Uh, pumps generally now are extremely high quality. Their failure rate is very low. Uh, almost always, if there's a problem, it's operator error um, or a site failure. I think um, what I heard last weekend at American Diabetes Association is the biggest problems with pumps right now is site failure, which is not common, uh, but when it happens, it can lead to DKA. So pumps and sensors have really advanced, but actually infusion sites, not as much. So I think that's also kind of the next frontier for these devices. Continuous glucose monitors, sometimes referred to as sensors. Uh, this technology was really developed over the last decade or so. Uh, we did clinic use first with these, but now of course these are available as a personal device and are really growing uh, in this market very quickly. These things record glucose 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and usually a value is obtained every five minutes. And most of them display it on the pump or on a device uh, every five minutes. There are also things called flash continuous meters now. That's the Freestyle Libre, which again, I'm not specifically promoting a, a, a specific device. It just happens to be one that has the technology. And it's actually tracking blood sugar, but it doesn't show it to you every five minutes. Uh, you have to scan it with a reader to get a device. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit as we go along here. Sensors generally record interstitial fluid glucose, not serum or capillary. So there's generally about a five minute lag or a 15 minute lag. However, many of them now in their algorithms kind of have that built into it. Uh, and some of the predictive technology devices have that. Uh, so I think this is becoming less and less of an issue. These things are getting into the range of a nine to 10% variability for accuracy. And uh, most meters now are 15%. So I never thought that I would say that sensors are more accurate than a meter, but I think that we are, are to that point that if the sensor is functioning properly, it is uh, more accurate than a meter. They measure that a little bit different ways, but uh, the outcome is the same. Interface devices of pumps and sensors have really been developed over the last decade. We're getting closer to the closed loop artificial pancreas system that would be consumer ready. Right now we have hybrid systems, which are sort of semi-automated devices, and that's getting pretty close. There are high low alarms for most of these except the flash meter that that the current one does not have alarms the future one will and it also has a trend alarm which shows if the blood sugar is rising fast or dropping fast it can actually predict if you're going to have a specific high or low and you can take action before it actually happens the early ones were just a high or low alarm you didn't get an alarm until it hit the number and sometimes then it was a little bit late this is the basic setup for a pump and sensor. Uh, this happens to be a Medtronic. I'm not promoting that, it's just a good picture. And it shows the uh, sensor site, which resides in the subcutaneous tissue. And that's an electrostatic device uh, connected to a transmitter, which may or may not be Bluetooth. That transmits data to the pump and the blood sugar is uh, po posted on the face of this particular pump, which is typical. And the pump has an insulin infusion set, which is a separate uh, site where the uh, insulin goes in through a plastic catheter that generally has to be changed every few days. The CGMs are generally changed every seven to 10 days, but that technology is advancing as well. Uh, you can see that on this pump, it says the blood sugar is seven. That's metric. 
Uh, so don't worry that this person had a blood sugar of seven. That's not, the, they did, um, but that's not the case. Uh, it, it's not the same as a seven in non-metric. I'm gonna go through some specific devices right now. Again, I am not promoting a particular device. I'm going to talk about the ones that are most commonly prescribed on the market. The Medtronic 670G is a hybrid closed loop system. It's sort of semi-automated and was the first step toward an artificial pancreas. That's the first one with this particular technology. They developed a new sensor for this one that was quite a bit better than the old one, and they really needed that uh, for the semi-automated features. And the Guardian 3 is a much better device than the uh, previous uh, sensor that was on the market. This one does have predictive algorithms. So it does predict if you're gonna be high or if you're going to be low, and that's a very useful feature. It's still dependent on the user for entering carb, uh, carbs and for finger stick glucose calibrations. This one requires two calibrations per day with a finger stick. Some of the others don't require that. Accurate carb counting, however, seems to really assist this device in its overall performance. So that's a real point of education for us at our Diabetes Center with all of these devices that have some of these more advanced features. Uh, the more accu accurate you are with carb counting, the better it performs and the less that you have to deal with. Um, so I think that's a really interesting feature. This happens to be the one that I've used for three years. Um, and like a lot of them with more advanced algorithms, I have fewer and fewer alarms over time. And it's been a very long time that I've had a blood sugar less than 54, which would be severe hypoglycemia. This one uses a contour meter that's exclusive to this device and it is linked. It has a feature called auto mode. Uh, the auto mode basically manage the base, manages the basal insulin by adjusting it or leaving it alone every five minutes. Uh, so the user doesn't have to do anything with basal insulin with this pump if they're in the auto mode. Um, it's uh, more likely to keep you in the target range, and we'll talk about what that is later. And it has that predictive low algorithm. So if you're heading for a low, it will tell you that before you get there in most circumstances. The OmniPod Dash is their newer device. This is the tubeless pump. Some people really like that, that it doesn't have any tubes. The device actually goes right on your body and delivers insulin that way. The personal device manager looks a lot like a smartphone. It does have a smartphone app. And with this one, you can share data with up to 12 friends and family. Uh, so sometimes this is viewed as sort of the pediatric pump. I wouldn't characterize that exclusively that way, but uh, parents like that they can see the data uh, remotely with their uh, child's device. This particular one interacts with a Dexcom 6 freestanding um, continuous glucose monitor, and I'll talk about that one later when we talk about freestanding CGMs. The Tandem T-Slim is also a device that interfere, uh, uh, interacts with the uh, Dexcom CGM. Uh, this one has a touch screen, which a lot of patients really like. That's a really good feature. As you can see, it displays the trend in the blood sugar on the face of the pump. Um, it also tells you uh, how much insulin is left on board, how much insulin is in the pump. This one has a feature that's fairly advanced called the Control IQ. And this is the first one on the market that actually delivers a partial correction bolus. So it not only manages the basal most of the time for the patient, it also will give small correction boluses. It's still important to enter carb counts accurately. And uh, this one is working toward interoperability, so it would be able to interact with a variety of different CGMs as they come on the market. The Vigo is kind of the anti-technology pump. Uh, this is the so-called patch pump. And again, like the Omnipod, it goes right on your body. Uh, it doesn't have a smartphone uh, app. It doesn't have a controller. Basically, when you want to deliver insulin, you push a button and it clicks and it delivers two units. Uh, so that's how uh, this one works. Dexcom also has a share device um, that uh, uses the cloud. And again, this can be shared with uh, different friends and family members. 
And uh, parents really uh, like this feature uh, with the Dexcom. There are, of course, uh, freestanding continuous glucose monitor sensor systems. Uh, and these can be used with injections or with a pump. You don't necessarily have to have a pump to have a CGM. And we are actually seeing more and more CGM users, uh, non-pump users all the time. I just talked to you about the Dexcom 6. That's the one that interfaces with the T-Slim or the Omnipod. It does not need finger sticks unless you think there's a problem. And uh, you can share up to 10 people, and this one uh, collects up to 10 to 14 days worth of data. The Freestyle Libre is not a true continuous system because it doesn't display it continuously. You have to use that reader that you can see in the picture there and swipe the device, which goes right on your body. And it works up to 14 days. This version does not have alarms, but their new one, the Freestyle Libre 2, will have high and low alarms. So that will be a welcome feature with this device. We've kind of stayed away from this device in most persons with type one because of that lack of uh, high and low alarm features. The Medtronic Guardian 3 also has a freestanding application. It's uh, just like or very similar to the one that goes with the pump. And you can share, this has a share feature too and also has a smartphone app. There is an implantable continuous glucose monitor. Uh, this is not much used in the United States, but it's really gaining some traction in Europe. Uh, it's a, a small a piece of plastic that's implanted in the upper arm, and it, connect, it uh, collects data for up to 90 days. Uh, there's also an on-body reader that goes over the top of this thing on the surface of the skin, and uh, it vibrates if you're having a high or low. Uh, so it's an on-body alarm, actually. It's very accurate. Uh, it's in the neighborhood of 8.5%. And um, it doesn't really require finger sticks, but it recommends finger sticks if you're unsure that the value is correct or if you're having symptoms of hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. It's a Bluetooth connective uh, to a smartphone as well. I think the drawback with this, well, I mean, at first glance, this looks like this is an ideal device. But every 90 days, you need to have a small procedure in the doctor's office. Uh, there's going to be some logistics uh, that go with that. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind as well, that you're going to need that done every time. That'll probably mean a longer appointment. That'll probably mean a little bit higher cost. However, the concept of this and the performance of this device is very good. Many of you are probably familiar with professional continuous glucose monitors. Uh, we were doing these before the consumer devices came out. The consumer devices came out in 2006. Um, we put these on patients in the office and we collect up to seven to 14 days of blood glucose data. And uh, this is really good for people who have control problems that are hard to figure out. Because again, you get 24 seven data for all of these days. And uh, we sometimes collect data for people who are considering a pump uh, but we also use these fairly routinely for patients that are just having control problems because we can see those trends. And that's extremely helpful, uh, especially for some of these patients you're seeing who might really be struggling with A1Cs over nine, people who are having a lot of hypoglycemia, people with seemingly unpredictable blood sugars uh, can be very useful. When we have a patient who wants to go on a CGM, we often do a CGM Pro first just so they can see what it's like to have the device on their body. The CGMs, whether they are personal devices or professional devices, uh, now um, generate what's called the ambulatory glucose profile report. And although they all look a little bit different, they have many common features that have now uh, come to be known as standard features. So there's a couple of things on a typical report that I would want to show you here. Uh, the easy thing to do first is to look at the graph. I don't suggest that. I suggest that you look at some of the statistics uh, in the upper part of this graphic. I look at the bar graph first when I look at these, and they show uh, blood sugars that are in the target range, which is green. And for most people with diabetes, that should be 70% or greater. 
You can also see the yellow is high, that's greater than 181, and the very high, which is greater than 250. This also shows low and very low. Low is defined as less than 70, and very low is defined as less than 54. Uh, I'll talk about goals with these before we're done today. Uh, as well, you can see on the left-hand side of the graphic, the average daily glucose is 173. It does give you a predicted A1C or a glucose management indicator. In this instance, it was 7.6. And the glucose variability was 49.5%, which is not huge, uh, but it is a little bit more variable than we might like. Then I look at the graph. And the overall trend here is somebody who is very good overnight with occasional lows overnight, but they're clearly having postprandial blood sugar elevation with breakfast and with supper. So really we would be addressing uh, mealtime issues with this particular patient. That might mean a med adjustment, it might mean a smaller meal, it might mean exercise after the meal or any or all of those. And then at the very bottom is actually a daily report which kind of supports uh, what I was just talking about. There is actually now an international consensus panel recommendation for appropriate times in range uh, that generally would track, uh, um, track into or uh, to uh, be similar to a target A1C of uh, less than seven. For most type ones and type twos, we want the target range to be greater than 70% greater than 180 to be less than 25% and greater than 250, less than 5%. Their low blood sugars should be less than 5%, less than four uh, of less than 70 and less than 1% of less than 54. With a profile like that, you can count on an A1C to be about seven, maybe a little bit less. People who are older and high risk, remember we usually have individualized A1Cs for them that may be more like 7.5 or eight, we're looking for greater than 50% in range, less than 50% greater than 180, and less than 10% greater than 250. And we want their overall hypoglycemia rate to be less than 1%. Uh, so we're really targeting lows here. In pregnancy with type one, that's about the same as a typical type one, although if you can do it tighter, you would. And in gestational, it's actually quite a bit more time in target range because we only have about eight weeks to work with a typical gestational. And if we don't have really tight control during that eight weeks, we can really have problems. It's really hard to have super tight control without a lot of hypoglycemia in pregnancy. That's why type one is a little bit different. But our approach to this is the tighter we can make it with minimal hypoglycemia, that's what we're going to do. And of course, with a CGM, that's great. Uh, we can see that every day if we want to. Uh, but typically we're looking for weekly trends. Uh, this actually was published uh, by the American Diabetes Association and other partners about a year ago. Uh, so these are the values that are now accepted as uh, the consensus. All of these devices have YouTube videos, their web pages are exceptional, and they quite often have videos embedded in their web pages. So if you want to learn more about these devices, that's a pretty good place to go or to talk to your representative. There's other data management systems out there that are independent of device. Tidepool is one that's an open source nonprofit. Um, they can manage many different devices, many meters, many pumps, many CGMs, uh, maybe some, uh, many uh, smartphone apps. Uh, they're building all the time with more and more devices. And uh, they have a really nice uh, uh, printout as well, which has a lot of the same components. You can see it has the graphic data. Uh, the time and range is displayed as that horizontal bar graph on the right. This particular person was 81% time and range with zero hypoglycemia. I think we could agree that would be an exceptional profile and no blood sugars over 250. With this person, I don't think I would do anything. Uh, this one also easily displays the total insulin per day. Remember, we're typically looking at about 50% bolus and about 50% basal, or it might be 40, 60, or 60, 40. Uh, people who are more aggressive do tend to have a little bit more bolus insulin. This person was 52, 48. So their data view is uh, very user-friendly as well. 
And the nice thing with this one is it uh, manages lots of different devices. There's also one by uh, Gluco called the Diasend. Again, the data is similar. It's just a little bit different layout. And instead of bar graphs, uh, they have circle graphs. This one also easily displays the number of carbs per day. The other ones will do that too. You just have to page through them to find it. And this one uh, also will track activity if the user enters it. So who should have a pump or a sensor? Well, patient selection is very important. Generally for us at our diabetes center, it's patients who are not meeting goals on multiple daily injections. Usually patients who are good with follow-up, but not necessarily. Sometimes technology will take somebody who's not functioning that well and help them do better, uh, but they require a lot of support. People who are good with phoning in, texting, in-person visits, emails, appointments, Quite often, people who are a little bit compulsive, in my mind, do a little bit better with these. Patients with a lot of blood glucose variability. Patients with asymptomatic hypoglycemia, this is a critical feature for them. So it's really important to select proper patients to maximize success, and proper training and follow-up are critical for success. Some people are doing great two to four weeks after they get started, don't need a lot of input from us unless they're having a problem. Some people, it's more like four to six months. Uh, so you need to be prepared for that follow-up piece. So how do we get started? Well, think about who's on your team. There's the primary provider, usually a nurse, maybe a CDE, maybe a nutritionist, maybe an advanced practice nurse or PA, and then others. And not every practice will have every team member. Uh, of course, CGMs and smart meters have downloadable data sets. Uh, you can assign this to a particular person in your office, or maybe this is something the nurse does. Um, and you can get that printout really in very short order. All of the major device manufacturers have software uh, that can be used for this. And uh, the patient can actually do this in advance of their visit. Many of these can be done at home. Once you've done a few of these and have developed a routine, the flow is usually pretty good. Having it in advance is best, but I'm not going to waste the appointment time with the patient waiting around for a printout before I start seeing the patient. I often do the entire patient visit first and then do the data management piece at the end of the visit after I have the printout. And that actually works pretty well. CGM interpretation can be billed. Many third party payers cover this service. The code is 95251. Uh, this must include a minimum of 72 hours of data and then all the usual medical record stuff, as well as the indication for the device placement. So let's do a patient case. This is Maria. She's a typical type 2. Uh, she's 68, had for eight years, has hypertension, dyslipidemia, albuminuria, and transient ischemic attack. So she has microvascular and macrovascular complications. Her GFR is 45, which is low. BMI is elevated at 30, and her A1C is 8. But she's noting midday highs and over, or I'm sorry, midday lows and overnight lows. And she's on a typical set of medications for a person with type 2 diabetes, including a statin. She's on blood pressure medication, metformin, aspirin, glimipiride, and she is on basal insulin. So which of the following glucose metrics is thought to be at least as important as the A1C? Well, if we're talking about a CGM, it's all of these. These are really starting to rival uh, A1C for usefulness, and they certainly um, are a good piece to use in addition to an A1C. You can't get glucose variability off of an A1C, but you sure can with a CGM. So she, her A1C uh, goal has some factors to consider. She already has microvascular and macrovascular disease. I don't know if she's a great candidate for an A1C of less than seven, but she certainly should have one better than eight. Uh, she has other comorbidities as noted. We want to think about life expectancy, which is at least a few years here. And we want her to really be able to deal with these lows. That seems to be her biggest concern. So what's going on with her? Well, 
Some stuff in her history is concerning with respect to her complications. She has an elevated A1C with occasional lows, which is certainly possible. So a good next step for her actually is a CGM. And this is what she looked like originally. Uh, she was 43% time in range. Not a lot of time with lows, but uh, they were bothersome to her, about 3%. And she did have some less than 54, which is certainly a bother. We were able to get eight days of data off of this, and her average was 182, which was a predicted A1C of 7.7. .7. So that close to her eight. Uh, glucose variability, not extreme, about 35%. Um, so would she be a good CGM candidate? I would say yes. She's having some symptomatic lows. She's not meeting a target range of at least 50% for this particular person. And uh, these lows are bothersome to her. She is on insulin, so that's a good indication for this. And she's experiencing these problems with uh, fairly uh, aggressive treatment. So her insulin and glimipiride were increased. Her A1C was a lot better when she came back. You can see the estimated A1C a few months later was 5.9. She's in target 64% of the time, but look at those lows. She's got 17% of her time less than 70. That's completely unacceptable. That's got to be less than 5% and ideally less lower than that. So her A1C, her great A1C is uh, by the virtue of lots of lows, which in my mind is not a treatment success. So uh, we may not have picked that up uh, without her being on a CGM. Um, you can see on the graphic data that her overnights are pretty good, but during the day is when she's having lows. So in my mind, I think the glimipiride is the offender here, and I would probably dial that back, and then we'd get another uh, data look maybe in a couple of weeks. With her. I want to show a few that are exceptional before we close out because they do exist. Uh, this is one of my type 1s on a pump and a CGM. Almost 99% time in target range. No blood sugars over 180. 1% less than 70. And her variability is 19.1%, which is very narrow. And she wears the device 97% of the time. Uh, so these do exist. They're not common. Uh, we have a lot of people walking around who are greater than 70, but one like this is exceptional. This is another one here, too. Um, you can see by the um, graphic data that his range is very narrow, very good average. Uh, auto mode, 92% a week. Uh, blood sugar is 143, plus or minus 40. 82% time in range, only 2% less than 70. And those top ones, only 3% less than 250. We really like to see that, too. The other portions of an ambulatory glucose profile interpretation template that you need for documentation might look like something like this. And this is data that's just copied uh, directly from the graphic data. And then you have to include an interpretation. So for Maria, I would have said, uh, originally my interpretation would have been uh, sporadic lows um, with an overall high average, less than 50% time in range. When she came back, I would have said unacceptable time in hypoglycemia appears to be more daytime. Medicare will cover personal therapeutic CGMs. Of course, you must have a diagnosis of diabetes, either type one or type two. The person has to have been testing their blood sugar four or more times daily. They need to be on multiple daily injections of insulin or be on a pump. They require frequent adjustments of uh, insulin based on their therapeutic CGM. So they're calculating doses basically is what that means. They've had an office visit in the last six months and are seen every six months. Some plans require every three, uh, so be aware of that. I think diabetes success comes when technology connects the user with their diabetes, not separates them from it. There's all types of technology for all types of patients. It's not just pumps and sensors. And you want to work together as a team to find out what's best for your patients. At minimum, if you can download logbooks and uh, CGMs, uh, that's a really nice thing to have in your clinic. Most of this comes from the American Diabetes Association standards of care. 
and from that consensus panel that I cited earlier in the presentation. Don't forget that there is a primary care version of the standards of care, which is condensed. That's called the abridged standards of care 2020. If you Google that phrase, abridged standards of care 2020, that will come up. And as I mentioned, Diabetes Forecast Journal has a consumer guide every year that has a very comprehensive list of devices and features. Of course, it's summertime. Normally we'd have baseball going now and I'm a big Chicago Cubs fan. Uh, so uh, no chance of that uh, right now or probably in the immediate future. But I thought it would be nice to see a full stadium on a nice summer day. This is my contact info. I do have a professional diabetes Facebook page where I post lots of information, some editorial content, and some of my own personal experiences with type 1. And that is all I have for today. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those now. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Yes, please go ahead and unmute yourself or go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Questions, comments, any cases you'd like to talk about with Dr. Johnson? Can you address cost to the patient? Yeah, most uh, commercial insurances in our region pay very well for these devices. The hurdle usually to overcome is the 20% uh, uh, of the device uh, when you first start. Um, but it's fair to say that insurances cover these devices uh, very well. I have to tell you, some of these CGMs are so popular that people are just buying them. Uh, we've had a number of type 2s in our practice who don't get approved for a CGM. So they just go to the pharmacy and pay cash for it and purchase it. I don't know what that costs. Um, but, and uh, then I, the I had a patient come back and say his monthly expenses is going to be $1,000 for the supplies with it. Well, that would be somebody who probably doesn't have very good coverage, okay. uh, large deductible plan. And unfortunately, there are people out there who have these really unsatisfactory insurance plans because they're low cost. This is kind of a separate issue, but we sometimes counsel patients on maybe paying a little bit more for a better plan so that their total yearly out of pocket is less. They're not always thinking of that when they're selecting a plan, particularly if they don't have employer insurance. But yeah, they're out there. We don't see a ton of that, but it certainly exists. Okay. The you. other thing they need to remember is it could be that their insurance wants to pay for a specific pump and CGM, and they might be on the one that's not preferred. This is Bree. I just wanted to mention that um, we just put out the 2020 Diabetes Burden Report from the state and included in there that North Dakota is one of only four states that doesn't have any minimum requirements for insurance coverage related to diabetes. So only one of four states that's Meaning that some of our patients could have far worse coverage for diabetes than in other states. And it's something that was put forth to, to the legislatures to look at in the next session. Dr. Johnson, this is uh, Shelley Berg from First Care. Our um, diabetic or our um, registered dietitian is looking at doing some larger group um, educational opportunities with prediabetes um, patients. And she is promoting um, CGM as part of uh, something in the future that she really wants to assist the doctors in managing. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have any um, time for her to email you or any insight in assisting her with that? Um, any sure. recommendations? Yeah, that that's probably warrants a separate conversation, but she can certainly reach out to me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's Christina B Bada if you get the email. So anyways, that's who will be contacting you, I hope. Okay. Thanks.
Does anybody else have questions, comments for Dr. Johnson? Okay, Dr. Johnson, do you have anything else for us? Uh, I, I think if you're going to start introducing more technology into your practice, it's worth talking to the company representatives. They're usually quite helpful. They're not just trying to sell you stuff. They want it to work right for you. Um, being able to download some of the common CGMs is great. Um, even if you're not going to do any pumps, you might uh, venture into the CGM arena. And um, being able to have that data from patients is, is fantastic. I'm doing 100% video visits during COVID and my patients who are on CGMs who download their data and email it to me in advance or post it to their password protected website, uh, having that at the time of the visit is really a, a really good piece for us.